All right. Um, you'll have your chance. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do, we're going to jump into the first presentation here in just a second. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and start, start sharing your screen, feel free to do that. So the first presentation we'll have today is on a project from a uh, proposal submitted by Virginia Tech and Merrill Mims, who um, is over there at Virginia Tech, and we'll talk about this work um, that they're going to get going in Southern Arizona. Um, And Meryl, I'm just pausing for a second because I had everybody's faces in front of the presentation. I don't know what that would do with the recording. No um, so I think I'm good to go now. Now, So um, Meryl, I will hand it over to you. Great, okay. Uh, hi everybody, thanks so much, Matt, and for the invitation and it's wonderful to join uh, this community and get a chance to talk to you all about uh, this project that we're just starting out. So, um, just uh, want to first acknowledge John Kraft, who's on the call uh, with me here. So we will both be available for questions, and we're really excited for your input at the end. Uh, and then Grace just introduced herself. So Grace is a technician with my team and has been um, helpful and just so awesome with this project from the beginning, from the proposal uh, through to some of the early work, particularly with the acoustic data, which you'll hear a little bit about. So certainly want to acknowledge uh, John and Grace and as well as Matt and all of Matt's help uh, from again, you know, the first few contacts about this proposal in this RFP uh, all the way through to really getting this project off the ground. So uh, again, I'm Meryl Mims. I'm at Virginia Tech. I'm assistant professor. And I want to start um, with this picture of this bullfrog. So this is actually a little bit of a backstory. This is the first a photo of the very first bullfrog that I ever encountered in Arizona. This is over 10 years ago during my first uh, field trip to the region. And so I've been doing research in the Huachuca Mountains and the surrounding areas, which you'll hear a little bit more about uh, today, uh, for, um, hard to believe, but the last decade, uh, with a real focus on uh, Arizona tree frogs and other uh, native uh, anurans, so frogs and toads in the region. Uh, and I've been really interested in this issue of bullfrog management because it's really an issue that you can't ignore if you're in this region. You know, you see them um, there, they're, they're just sort of a major factor on the landscape at this point. Uh, and so uh, essentially at this point, it's something that's been exciting to think about, to collaborate on, and to really uh, embrace a sort of a, an applied issue, something that we really need to think about when it comes to uh, conservation and management of aquatic species and habitat. So uh, I'm really excited for this formal opportunity to collaborate with uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, as well as uh, Forest Service and with John. I'm just checking my chat box here to make sure everything's okay. I'm actually not going to be, oh great, Matt, that's from you. I was going to say for anyone, if there's any issues with audio or anything else, please just unmute and let me know because I'm, I'm not going to monitor the chats as I'm going through. Okay, so um, for anybody who's unfamiliar with uh, bullfrogs, and I bet most of the folks on this call are, uh, bullfrogs are a major management challenge for aquatic habitats and species in the American West. Uh, the map that you see here is a uh, bullfrog occurrence uh, by major, major watershed and it illustrates the establishment of this non-native species uh, in many watersheds of the western U.S. And this um, it just shows the U.S., but their uh, bullfrogs are also established in over 40 other countries as well. Uh, they're a major challenge for sort of the management and conservation of aquatic habitat and species uh, because they are uh, disease vectors, they are novel competitors and predators on species that are often ill-equipped for these new interactions with this fairly large uh, amphibian that's sort of a new player on the landscape. Uh, and so for this reason, we've seen lots of efforts to either control or eradicate the species from local or even landscape scale regions and watersheds. So a couple examples of that, um, this is true in many regions uh, with case studies sort of increasingly available. Uh, there are some important lessons learned from um, a handful of uh, case studies that we have. One is that success often comes from intensive removal that targets multiple life stages and involves sort of multiple strategies. Uh, this often is sort of labor intensive with manual removal efforts. There are efforts to sometimes manipulate habitats, such as draining habitats, and uh, installing barriers, all sorts of things like that. And then once uh, sort of those initial efforts are in place, there's sort of the continual maintenance of buffer zones around critical habitat for other species. This often uh, sort of involves uh, continued effort that can go for multiple years. Uh, the study that's here at the, at the bottom left uh, by um, Kemeroff et al. is a study that uh, documents over eight years of sort of continual, or it's eight years of removal effort over a 14 year period 
uh, in Yosemite Valley. Uh, and then there's other uh, great examples of uh, big sort of landscape level initiatives in Arizona as well. Uh, one example of this is the Frog Team, which just uh, sort of encompasses years and years of work, decades uh, from this team of folks who have really tried to um, reduce uh, and eliminate bullfrog populations from critical habitat for species such as Chiricahua leopard frogs. So these types of examples really uh, sort of emphasize this all-in approach to remove with a sort of persistence that then is followed uh, with that removal effort of monitoring and sort of really extensive efforts. And so that really brings us uh, to this challenge. If you can't go all in because of logistical challenges, resource limitation, uh, or other things, can you develop a strategy for removal and control uh, that really targets specific populations? Would it work and what would it take? So when we think about bullfrogs as an example, if we wanted to develop a strategic removal and control um, approach, some information that we know we might need would include spatial information, sort of the lay of the land, especially where do we find aquatic habitats, we might also want to know uh, metapopulation dynamics and sourcing dynamics, uh, dispersal, stability, things really about what's going on with these populations. We might want to know something about environmental variability, right? Which ponds or habitats are likely to hold water and which ones might change uh, with climate change? So really thinking about these compounding threats to native species. And then finally, we might also be interested in interactions, right? Which species are, are most at risk from the presence of, of bullfrogs? And so these are questions that I've been thinking about for years, especially as we've sort of worked in this region where we know bullfrogs are present. Uh, I've talked about these questions for a long time with John Kraft and others. And so, you know, fast forward to uh, summer of 2020, and I was absolutely thrilled to see this RFP from the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, last summer. And so they uh, identified this need uh, and this interest in really incorporating species interactions, metapopulation dynamics, and other factors uh, that many of us recognize and have known for a long time are, are really important if you're going to try to prioritize removal of aquatic non-native species. So uh, this RFP came out, uh, I got on the phone with John, <laughs> and John was actually the one who alerted me to it. So we uh, built this proposal, and I just want to sort of pause and acknowledge here uh, that this was, um, this is a proposal that's primarily with Virginia Tech, uh, and U.S. Forest Service, but that we also had um, many other folks from Arizona Game and Fish, other federal agencies um, who were really helpful in pulling this together, uh, particularly with so much short notice, so uh, much appreciated. And this is sort of what we've come up with and what I'm going to talk to you about today. So our um, proposal title is uh, Simulating Metapopulations and Removal Tactics. Invasive management, which gets us to our acronym of SmartSim, and this is a data-driven multi-species simulation framework for effective management of aquatic invasive species in the southwestern U.S. And so, as I mentioned, uh, we kicked this off uh, in the fall. We're really excited to be uh, kind of moving ahead with this. Of course, as everyone on this call is aware, there's all sorts of challenges specific to the pandemic, but um, we've uh, we've already got some irons in the fire for this, and are really excited for uh, what's going to happen within this first year. So I sort of want to uh, give you an overview here uh, of the project. This is the text up top is um, a description of sort of what we're going to be doing with SmartSim. So again, the goal is sort of develop this and test this data-driven landscape scale simulation approach. Uh, and what we're really thinking about here is the optimization of control of aquatic invasive species that really helps us promote the persistence of at-risk species. So to do this, we have this case study um, where we're going to be looking at bullfrogs and Arizona tree frog populations in the Huachuca Mountains and Canelo Hills of Arizona, sort of a regional scale uh, proposal or project rather. The first objective uh, is to really think about bullfrog dispersal and recolonization uh, dynamics. And I'm going to use the next few uh, slides to kind of walk you through a roadmap for this project. And so this first objective really involves, uh, first and foremost, collecting and collating existing data that we have within our research team at Virginia Tech and that many others have uh, within the region. So that involves uh, uh, landscape data, climate data, data on species occurrences, as well as data on bullfrog biology. Uh, so that we're thinking about vital rates here uh, and other trait data that can help us understand uh, dispersal and recolonization dynamics. Once we pull those data together, uh, the next big challenge is identifying focal ponds on the landscape and then going out into the fields and deploying uh, uh, acoustic recorders as well as getting genetic data from bullfrogs uh, that are, are removed. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So it'll be collection of data uh, as well. 
We're going to continue that data collection while we apply some experimental treatments. And in this case, we're really thinking about whole farm removal as our experimental treatments. And that comes primarily in sort of two different ways, uh, both draining ponds, so physically sort of manipulating the, the landscape in that sense, and then also uh, whole farm removal, so manual removal of individuals. Uh, both the data that we have in hand as well as, as the data that we are collecting before and during these experimental treatments will then go into what, what we're sort of considering the outputs from this first objective. Those include species distribution models, both for the uh, bullfrogs as well as the target species. In this case, we're talking about Arizona tree frogs. But of course, the idea is to build a model that could be applied to other species as well. So we'll, we'll be focusing on tree frogs. Um, this could certainly be applied to and then we're also really interested in sort of the population structure and dispersal capacity of bullfrogs. And so to do this, we're really thinking about using this genomic approach uh, to look at connectivity between bullfrog populations. This first objective then feeds into the major second objective of this work, which is actually building the model itself. So this is building the smart sim model, developing it, and testing it. So to do that, we have these uh, sort of data inputs that we are considering. So again, this is thinking about uh, the landscape as a dynamic landscape. So not one where there are just ponds available, but also thinking about how those ponds are really available to aquatic species through time. So when do they hold water? How often do they hold water? Uh, we'll be considering multiple species. Again, these two primary species that we are thinking about as well as their interactions. Um, and then we're also thinking about their populations. So things like species specific vital rates, uh, dispersal capacity, demographics, those sorts of things. These get fed into this spatially explicit individual-based model. We're using a platform called PECSIM, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. But we already have this developed for Arizona tree frogs, so this will be a matter of expanding it to include bullfrogs as well. And then from that, we'll get outputs that we're really excited about. So in this case, uh, you know, if you think about, you know, we'll be applying these experimental approaches on the landscape, but it's really tough for us to then sort of test different futures of, okay, well, which on specifically uh, might we um, target at a, at a really large scale or what might happen under various climate change scenarios. So by running these simulations, it allows us to think about and really test different scenarios and then compare that back to what we're seeing on the landscape. Uh, some of those outputs will include potentially uh, optimal distribution and density of target sites for control efforts, as well as the distribution, the distribution population size and the connectivity of target species as well. And in this case, we're talking about outputs for both species. So this is really describing the major sort of effort for this project, this three-year project. And towards the end of the project, what we're really looking to do is think about um, what we've learned and bring together a, um, uh, experts from all over the region. So hopefully many of you that are on this call who are interested in this, uh, and we'd like to have an in-person workshop to discuss what we found, what are some of the limitations of this approach, and how might we see sort of transferability of this type of uh, approach to other species and regions. Uh, and the idea here is to couple that with training um, and, and workshops to allow individuals to apply this to their own systems uh, as well. And I know an in-person workshop may be uh, a really sort of dreamy, far off thing to think about right now. I'm sure we're all craving that, but we will get there eventually. So this is year three. And, and if this sounds interesting to you, please do reach out because it's um, we're hoping to not just sort of wait till the end of this, but to really be interacting with this community and, and receiving feedback on this as we go. So um, one of the things that really attracted me to the, uh, this opportunity and to really thinking about building this project uh, was that we have a lot of the data that were sort of just in that roadmap already existing. So a lot of this is we have this opportunity to really jumpstart this initiative. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we have and what we're building uh, as this project gets going. So one thing, um, we have quite a bit of detailed spatial, spatial data uh, for the region. Uh, as well as occurrence data for many species in the region too. So that helps us sort of think about what we're looking at and where we might expect to find these species on the landscape. We have data on metapopulations for both species. For Arizona tree frogs, this is a species we've studied uh, for uh, the better part of six years in this region. So we have a good understanding of uh, where to find them, at least we think so, <laughs> uh, and their genetics. I say it like that because as many of you know, there's just an unprecedented drought in the region. So we, um, every time we think we know something, you know, the, the, the weather and the landscape kind of shows us and always reveals uh, what, what we don't know or what's sort of surprising. So, um, but we, we are sitting on a lot of genetic data. It's, it's exciting to think about pulling in the bullfrogs into this as well. 
We do have some genetic data for bullfrogs from uh, removal efforts in 2010 and 11. And again, we'll be getting more information from um, tissue samples that are collected through removal efforts with this project too. We also have some long-term environmental variability, um, some understanding of it in the region, including uh, looking at hydro periods of ponds. I'm gonna give sort of a couple slides here in a minute to dig into that. And these uh, hydro period data are right now are really based on satellite imagery, um, but we also have some fine scale temporal uh, monitoring that uh, uses temperature loggers as well. And then for species interactions, you know, this is an area where we have a lot of room to potentially improve and explore. So right now, when we think of species interactions, we're really talking about co-occurrence of bullfrogs and tree frogs. There's a lot of room here to improve on um, sort of what the dynamics are when you have these species co-occurring. What does predation look like? You know, is it, are, it, are Arizona tree frogs excluded by the presence of bullfrogs? All sorts of questions to dig into there. So that's something we'll certainly be uh, sort of exploring with the model and really looking into that sensitivity to these types of parameters. And then finally, perhaps the most exciting part is that we actually have uh, you know, bullfrog removal that's been going on and that will continue to go on uh, on the ground. So, and this is again through both the direct removal of individuals and through pond draining. So all of this, feeds into this modeling framework uh, through HEXM, which again, I'll, I'll sort of wrap up the talk here in a few minutes by sharing a little bit of what those outputs look like. So just to dive into these my last few minutes and tell you a little bit about where we are. Uh, for collating existing data, uh, some of the goals include leveraging the existing data that we have. Uh, these include uh, sort of these um, uh, data that will help us inform and move efforts efforts that will help us think about which sites to target during field work, uh, as well as how to build these simulations most effectively. In terms of the status of this, we have, um, we are collating existing spatial data, hydrological data, and species occurrence data. That includes what we have in the lab, as well as data available to us from partners uh, who are willing to share that with us. And right now, we are identifying focal ponds for the year one bullfrog removal and acoustic recorder uh, deployment. So on the right here, you can see um, this is a uh, map of our study region. The National Forest, where we're going to be focusing these efforts, is sort of outlined in green here. And you can see sort of some of the spatial data that we have for where we find uh, some of these species uh, on the landscape. And some of the areas that we are looking, and I just had a, a phone call on Friday with John, so we're really starting to dig into which ponds are going to be uh, targeted during the first year. But just to give you a very broad sense, we're sort of looking at areas right at that boundary of where we see these species um, starting to co-occur, seeing the boundaries of these distributions really approaching one another. I wanted to quickly show you as well some of our hydro period data. So this is uh, data from Google Earth uh, historical imagery. And this gives us a sense of which ponds are um, either permanent or near permanent with water uh, in terms of their, their, um, the duration of water, and then which ones are maybe more intermittent, which ones are dry, and then of course there's a bunch here with black dots that we have not assessed. Um, but what's really sort of interesting about this is that you know, this sphere is quite dry and what shows up as what we thought was permanent uh, certainly may change through time. So this is something, another area that we're gonna really, really have to scout on the ground. Um, for anybody who's interested in these methods, this is something that we published last year. So we've, this data set is, is out there along with the methods, methods for that. We also have uh, preliminary hydro period data from over 30 years of Landsat imagery. And again, this sort of captures more that temporal dynamic here of looking at ponds. You can see sort of the wetted ponds or the proportion of wetted ponds here in these bar graphs and compared to sort of the uh, 80s and 90s into sort of the, uh, the late 2000s and um, uh, the 20 teens, you can see that the, the number of wetted ponds in both the dry season, which is the light blue, and, and the wet season, which is the dark blue, uh, really starts to decrease through time. So this is something that we're really trying to kind of get into here as well. Uh, for the acoustic um, monitoring, uh, well, oh, sorry. He's on the end of the, he said his issue was he had Muted Tom, I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, so we've got an uh, acoustic monitoring array uh, as well here. Um, and so this is what we're gonna be trying to do is put out 50 uh, recorders uh, at different ponds. We are working with, um, uh, we're working in the lab, Grace is doing this work right now to build these automatic identifiers. And so these include, right now we've deployed a handful of these uh, recorders um, from Cornell. We're replacing these with some through wildlife acoustics and we're testing these in the lab right now to get a sense of how long the batteries last 
and how to really think about how often to visit these recorders and download those data uh, from the field. And so happy to talk more about this and sort of what that's going to look like. Um, this is an image of what it looks like from the, um, the, the app on the phone. This is a photo by uh, Grace here. And this is what the data look like when you're looking at these and visualizing them. So you can see here on the left, this is sort of a single individual that's called. And then on the right, uh, this is uh, a chorus of Arizona tree frogs. And what Grace is working on at this point is annotating uh, over 1,000 hours of data from 2018. And we're working on automatically being able to identify that. So we'll to identify these calls and choruses. So we'll be doing that for um, both the tree frogs as well as the bullfrogs. I know I'm getting close to my time and I'm approaching the end of the talk, so hang with me here, guys. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about quickly are the, uh, the genomic methods. So uh, we, again, will be using population genomics with neutral markers. So this gives us a sense of sort of what's going on with the metapopulations uh, of, these, of these bullfrogs uh, on the landscape. And uh, what's really exciting is that we have an ad out right now for a postdoc, and we will soon be recruiting a technician on this as well. So if you know anybody who might be interested in this uh, type of approach or project, please do send them my way. I'm happy to forward that ad uh, as well. And again, what's really cool here is that we've got some, um, some, some historical data from about 10 years ago, and we'll be supplementing that now. So we'll actually have this temporal piece with the genomics as well. And the last thing that I'll share is this is an output from the Hexen model that we are going to be working to expand for bullfrogs. These are outputs from the Arizona tree frog. So this is a model that uh, should be published later this year. We have um, what's showing here is basically the, these, each one of these dots are ponds on the landscape. And you can see from comparing the left to the right, the ones on the right have far fewer dots with colors. Uh, you can see that there's sort of these isolated clusters on the landscape. And so this reflects these, these uh, frogs getting sort of stuck at core ponds uh, through time because of just pure reductions in hydro period uh, through time. So as we sort of stimulate changes in the pond hydro periods due to climate change, we see these species effectively getting stuck. And what we're really, um, are sort of isolated in these core ponds. And what we're really interested in now is how when we add bullfrogs into this model, what then happens? Do we see sort of a, a decrease in the uh, population sizes and numbers for Arizona tree frogs with bullfrogs added? Um, or you know, what, what types of outputs are, are we seeing when we, when we sort of expand this model. And so the, the goals here, again, bring those bullfrogs into this. Um, and at this point, uh, we are looking through the literature to really think about which vital rates we have good data for for the bullfrogs. We did get a trait database out for neurons of the U.S. Uh, this was published just a couple months ago. But again, this is an area where when you think about vital rates for bullfrogs, we are absolutely open to inputs from anybody on the call, or anybody locally who has um, some, some thoughts about which vital rates we should really be looking at. So please do reach out. We welcome any additional life history information for bullfrogs. And so I'll just wrap up with this last slide kind of showing this is the, the project timeline. And just to kind of give everybody again to emphasize that we're right at the start of this. Um, you know, here we are, we are excited about uh, getting going on this. Of course, you know, like everybody, we're going to be flexible with the pandemic, but, um, you know, if this is something that you are interested in, uh, again, start thinking about um, if this is, this might be worth your time to join us on this training workshop uh, during the last year of the project and whether or not you want to be involved in those conversations um, now. So this will be, for many of you, you might be familiar with this, but that training workshop will take place at the African Rural Research Ranch um, at the Audubon Society. So with that, I will close. I'm sorry I'm a couple minutes over, but uh, thank you so much for listening. And again, hopefully we'll have some time so that I can take some questions. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Meryl. Um, I don't have any questions in the chat box yet. Um, I, do have, I do have one, but before I take up time, does anybody want to unmute themselves and ask any questions of Meryl? Sure, I'll ask a question. Um, Meryl, we've talked lots about uh, how important it is to understand dispersal uh, of these different critters on the landscape, but I'm wondering how much you think you can learn from this modeling about like, so obviously the importance of a particular pond for supplying more bullfrogs depending on its hydro period. Do you think we can also learn something about dispersal across the matrix, like between ponds, is there any capacity to use like what kinds of landscape they're traveling across or like where they're able to move and where they're not able to move? 
Yeah, that's a great question, Rebecca. And of course, like here, you know, you guys are getting like the 10,000 foot overview. So I glossed over so much of this and it's very easy to say, we're gonna learn so much from genetics, but of course there's sort of like two things to consider. The first is that genetics um, and genomics in this case are an imperfect, you know, predictor of dispersal. There's some, there's a lot of processes that sort of go between what we see with genetics and what's actually happening on the ground. Um, but I am optimistic that we will have sort of enough genetic structure that we'll at least be able to start identifying clusters of bullfrogs on the landscape. And what I think will really help is having that temporal dimension so that we can not just look at a single snapshot in time, but sort of what's going on through time. And we're really excited, you know, in my mind, it's sort of this catch me too. You don't really wanna see bullfrogs coming back to ponds where you've already removed them. At the same time, that is exactly the kind of individual that we wanna intersect because hopefully we've then got sort of a reference of where it may have come from. So that's sort of the first answer is like, hopefully that we are able to think about sourcing dynamics in that way. And the second piece in terms of how they're moving across the landscape, uh, definitely, you know, I hope that is something we can speak to in terms of what those corridors might look like. Uh, we are able to do that with landscape genetics, uh, but it does, the utility of coupling the spatial and the genetic data really depends on a lot of factors, and it depends on sort of the quality of the genetic data that you get in terms of the, the degree of being able to resolve that structure. So I'm optimistic. Um, maybe I can present again in a year or 18 months, <laughs> and we'll, I'll be able to answer that a little better with less speculation. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Rebecca. And um, Meryl, let's touch on a couple of points that I wanted to make sure to reemphasize. Um, you know, the first is that one reason we are convening this group is to provide, you know, feedback to these folks as they, as they launch into their projects and as the projects develop over time. Um, and for all, you know, all four of these projects, we do plan to make sure that we'll have an annual, something like that presentation back to the community of practice with an update on where the project is at. Um, so hopefully there'll be a chance for recurring feedback from this group, um, especially as the group grows. I'm excited to see how things go. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, the only thing I was going to add, Meryl, is, um, you know, you mentioned the workshop uh, to talk about a, a tr essentially a training session for this. Um, and I'm excited to build off the momentum that we'll have off after the Bullfrog uh, workshop that we're gonna host starting next week, which I'll put another plug for here um, at the end of the call. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing how the workshops can inform each other and how this group will help kind of guide those along. So, so that's that. Um, last check here, make sure I don't have any other comments in the chat box. The only other thing I was gonna say is that Meryl obviously has some practice on Zoom calls because that was a record response time for me to know somebody else. I was impressed. I was still trying to find my buttons. Um, hey, well, it was right there, so it was easy to, to do. Yeah, I'm telling you, the skills you get from, from teaching through the pandemic are, uh, I don't know if I'll ever use them again, but it's, um, it's definitely wild. So, well, thank you all so much for your time. And Matt, thank you. And I just wanna thank John, I know he's there. So I'm sorry, I kind of popped all the air time, John, but you know. Thank you. Excellent, no problem. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Meryl. Um, really appreciate it. Um, and I'm gonna push this forward quickly to the second presentation uh, of Rebecca Jane Best from NAU and David Ward from USGS. So when you guys are ready, uh, feel free to take it over and share your screen. Great, thanks very much, Matt. Um, David's gonna share our slides and I'll say a few things at the beginning and then David's gonna tell you most of the exciting uh, details. So um, I'm an aquatic community ecologist at NAU. I'm really interested in the communities of invertebrates uh, and other uh, insects in um, habitats in northern Arizona like stock ponds. So we have all of these different isolated uh, aquatic habitats, what lives in them. And obviously we have all of these observations that in some places you get a bunch of crayfish and nothing else. Uh, so based on that interest, I have started collaborating with David at the USGS who has a much longer history of trying to control all kinds of invasive species um, in different important aquatic habitats in the southwest. And so the project that we are just getting started on uh, has a couple of different components. Uh, it's really focused on investigating a new tool for controlling uh, crayfish in aquatic habitats uh, in the field. 
we'll start out looking at concentrations of um, ammonia as a chemical control agent in the lab, investigating uh, tolerance of different concentrations at different stages and species of crayfish. Um, and then the second part will be really trying to move that out into the field and in field habitats that have more complex places for a crayfish to hide from control efforts and also have more complex um, chemical and specifically ammonia and nitrogen cycling, how, um, how effective is using ammonia as a control agent out in the field. So those are the two components. And um, David's going to tell you a lot more about the details of both of those. But what I wanted to highlight at the beginning was really the second component that we're excited about getting out into the field once we've done some initial laboratory investigations has both opportunities and uh, challenges. So one of the challenges is really finding, um, is going to be finding the best places to do this work out on the field um, within the context of existing regulations about the use of chemical treatments to control uh, crayfish and fish on the landscape, which we'll talk more about. Um, but there's also a couple of collaborative opportunities at this field stage that I got pretty excited about based on the other presentations we heard about um, crayfish projects funded by the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service back in uh, December. So when we get to this stage of trying to control and remove crayfish in some field habitats, I see lots of great opportunities to share the data that we have and have maybe help collect more data on um, the types of habitats that crayfish end up dominating versus being absent from, specifically the stock ponds uh, that we have been working in um, to complement or to contribute to some of the other work on crayfish distribution modeling. And then also, if we can successfully remove crayfish in uh, the field, there's this opportunity to look at recolonization after that removal that could be complementary to some of the um, other efforts looking at uh, community impacts of crayfish by removing them in different ways. So just wanted to highlight kind of the two scales of the um, experimental work that we are proposing to do, and then the challenges and the opportunities with that big piece. Um, and then I will turn it over to David to tell us about all the details. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm, I'm super excited to be working with Rebecca and, um, and also the new grad student that will be pulling on through NAU that'll be able to work on this full time. Um, let me know if, uh, hopefully you guys can all see the, the slides and, uh, and hear me okay. But um, so I've been, I've been thinking about killing crayfish for about the last 15 years. Um, you could kind of say it's kind of like a hobby. So I'm, I'm really excited to be able to um, have a format and a forum to be able to, to try and push, push this forward. Um, so as I started thinking about how do you kill a crayfish? Well, it has to be something that's safe to put into the environment. People really don't like you putting anything toxic into their water supplies. So it has to be something natural. Um, and then the unique thing about crayfish is that they can crawl away from anything that they don't like. So if you want to remove crayfish, you've got to make sure it's something that they're not going to sense and that they're, gonna, they're not going to crawl away from. And then really it needs to be something that's logistically feasible on, on a larger scale um, for it to be cost effective. And that's really why we hit upon ammonia because it fits all three of those things, those three things. Ammonia is um, endogenously produced by the organisms itself. They don't seem to detect it and crawl away from it because it's their own waste product and it is economically feasible. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of covered that. That's why ammonia really is unique amongst the different toxicants that might be used to, to remove um, invasive aquatic organisms, is that it's endogenously produced by the organisms itself. Um, and then really um, what makes ammonia also unique is it's really specific to gill-breathing organisms. So terrestrial organisms um, and other organisms have, have developed other ways to get rid of ammonia out of their bloodstream. Um, but aquatic organisms have gills. And what they're doing is they're taking the, the ammonia out of their bloodstream and diffusing it directly into the water as that water passes over the gills. So that's really an advantage for us in that we can target something 
um, to remove these species uh, utilizing the, the things that we know about, about gills. And the bacteria in the natural environment then detoxifies that ammonia naturally through what's known as the nitrogen cycle. And I'm just gonna run through that real quick. So you've got, you've got an aquatic organism and it's producing waste, which is ammonia or an H3. And then that ammonia is being broken down by nitrosomonas bacteria in the environment and converted into nitrite. So this intermediate product. And then the nitrite is being converted into nitrate by nitrobacter, a different bacteria that's mostly anaerobic. And then that nitrate is being used by plants um, and algae and things like that as, as fertilizer. So this is the natural cycle that's happening all the time, all around us, that's naturally detoxifying ammonia. So this is really an elegant kind of a way to get rid of an, an invasive aquatic species. We're gonna use their own waste product and we're gonna rely on the natural um, nitrogen cycle to clean it up. And another great thing about this is really we're getting two treatments with one dose. So this, this intermediate product, the nitrite, is also really toxic to aquatic organisms, okay? So ammonia is toxic, it's neurotoxic, and, it, and it's gonna kill um, the, um, the aquatic organism through that pathway. And then the nitrite is blocking oxygen transport. So it binds at a higher affinity um, than oxygen does. So if you have a lot of nitrite in the water, it's gonna cause the hemoglobin to not transport that oxygen very well. So we've got two different um, sort of toxic pathways and they're happening probably seven to 10 days apart. So we basically are getting a double treatment with one dose, which is also a real advantage of, of this tool. Another advantage is that ammonia is super soluble. If you put a little bit of it into a body of water in one corner, it's gonna naturally diffuse throughout that whole body of water. Um, and crayfish don't sense it and don't crawl away from it. It's their own waste product and they, they don't recognize it as detrimental. So all of those things are, are huge advantages. Um, ammonia toxicity changes uh, with pH, and that's really the key to being able to use this tool um, effectively. So when, when you have ammonia in water, it forms into two different parts. You've got ionized ammonia, NH4+, and you've got unionized ammonia, NH3. And it's the unionized ammonia that zips right through the gill tissue and, uh, and can kill things. Um, the ionized form gets blocked by the gills and doesn't go through. And that relationship between ionized and unionized forms of ammonia um, in the water is really dependent on pH. So this graph shows how it's also affected a little bit by temperature, but it's mostly affected by pH. So for example, if you have a pH of 7.5, you're gonna have almost no unionized ammonia, NH3, in the water. The non, you're gonna have almost no ammonia in its toxic form, okay? But if you bump that pH up two points to 9.5, you're gonna have over 40% NH3. You're gonna have most, you're gonna have a large percentage of it that is unionized ammonia that's gonna to be toxic. So this has huge implications for a tool that we're trying to use to get rid of an aquatic organism and also it has really some promising things to be able to detoxify and make it so it's no longer toxic just by manipulating pH, which in a lot of systems is, is relatively easy. Okay, so how do you change the pH? Well, you take baking soda, which we eat and you heat it and it becomes sodium carbonate or soda ash. So this goes back to my first point again, if you're gonna put things in people's water, it's gotta be super safe and baking soda is pretty safe and it's used all the time. Um, sodium carbonate or soda ash is used all the time in your municipal water supplies. It's used in swimming pools all the time to adjust pH, okay? Another advantage of using ammonia as a tool for removing invasive aquatic species is that unlike something like rotenone, where it's really hard to tell what your concentration is, it's hard to know if you have you know, a high enough dosage to be able to kill things, um, you can go to any pet store and you can buy off the shelf a water quality test kit that just has a little um, tube that you fill with water and you put some chemicals in there and it changes color. And if it turns really dark green, like in this photo, you know that it's gonna be lethal to your fish. If you wanna get a little fancier, you can get one of these digital meters, digital handheld meters that runs about 45 bucks. Um, if you wanted to know exactly what your ammonia readings are. But this is a huge advantage. You don't have to send things off to the lab um, or have an expensive mobile lab at your site to be able to know whether or not you have a dosage that's gonna be effective at, uh, at removing whatever invasive aquatic organism you're trying to get rid of. 
So when I started thinking about this, we started using liquid ammonia. Um, and what we found out in a hurry is that liquid ammonia has lots of fumes. So this image of me at the top is, is me wearing a respirator and this little strip is an is ammonia detector. It turns green if there's bad fumes around. And we found out that as a liquid, ammonia is really toxic to work with. And so we're looking for other forms of ammonia and we hit upon using ammonium chloride, which looks just like table salt. And it's pretty benign and it's, it's easy to work with. It doesn't have bad fumes and you put it in water and then it creates the ammonia in the water. And what we found is that we could decrease the amount of ammonium chloride that's actually needed to get a lethal concentration to kill aquatic organisms by adding the soda ash to it, by changing the pH. So we're basically upping the um, percentage of unionized ammonia to get a toxic effect. And then this third um, bar in my graph down here has Na2SO3, so that's sodium sulfite. So sodium sulfide is what they put on your meat in the grocery store to make it look red and fresh. It's an oxygen scavenger. So if you add a little bit of an oxygen scavenger to the water, what that does is it's going to reduce the oxygen content in the water and the organism is going to start to breathe or, or um, pass water over its gills more rapidly. And that's going to move the ammonia into its bloodstream more quickly. So by combining these things, by combining soda ash and sodium sulfide, we can kill um, things that are harder to kill, which is what we're going to need for crayfish because they're really hard to kill. Um, and this just graph just shows how we could reduce the amount of ammonium chloride that it takes to kill fathead minnows in some of our, our laboratory trials. Okay, so basically we're buying ammonium chloride. Nice thing is you can just get it off Amazon in a 50 pound bag and uh, then you can get soda ash off Amazon too and we're mixing it in a one to four ratio. Um, and then if you need, if you have something that's really tough to kill, like a crayfish, you might want to add some sodium sulfite, and that would also be one part. So one part ammonium chloride, one part sodium sulfite, and four parts of soda ash. And that's sort of our formulation that the USGS has applied for a composition of, um, composition of materials patent on. It's taking a really long time for that patent to be evaluated. I think things have slowed down a lot with, with the COVID stuff. Um, but we're hoping we'll hear back on that um, before long. And really all that does is just makes it so if somebody wants to make this and sell it as a commercial product, they'd have to come and talk to USGS about it. But we've created a label for it. Um, we're calling it Ritafish and uh, and packaging it in these uh, Mylar bags uh, so that you could easily use it for uh, getting rid of your, your invasive species. One of the things that we found out is that uh, we went down to Southern Arizona to try this um, at Joe Austin's ranch to get rid of some uh, mosquito fish down there because uh, he wanted Gila top minnow. And I asked him if he wanted to pull his cows off of all these tanks while we treat it. And he's like, oh no, go ahead, just treat it. He said, I feed a ammonium chloride to my cows as a feed supplement. And I didn't know that at the time, but um, ammonium chloride is used as a feed supplement for ungulates because it improves digestion and it prevents bladder stones. So any, anytime we have something that we can use to, for management of invasive aquatic species that ranchers also like, I think that's a real, gonna be a real advantage uh, for us. Okay, so here's the hard part. How do we get from sort of the science to usable management tools when it comes to controlling invasive crayfish? Um, and uh, we know that ammonia can be really damaging on the environment. So like, for example, if a wastewater treatment plant is discharging a lot of ammonia into the environment for a long period of time, that can be really damaging. And, and so people know that ammonia can have really harmful effects. But what we need to do is kind of transition that line of thinking into thinking, how can we use ammonia as a tool for invasive aquatic species control? So pesticides are registered by the EPA through the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, okay? And in order to get registration to use something like this, it takes a lot of data and a lot of time, and it's pretty expensive. Um, the EPA has what's called an experimental use permit, which you can get temporarily to kind of gather data. But unfortunately, the requirements that it takes to get the experimental use permit are almost as onerous as the, the requirements to get registration. So currently we have a student, a master student at NAU, Eric Fry, who's working on the first steps to try and get an experimental use permit for use on fish. And what he's discovered is that this is a really difficult process and requires a lot of data and, and it's gonna be hard 
Um, but he's, he's making progress on that. But there are an exemption. The EPA said, okay, if your water body is really super small and things are controlled enough, you could gather some data on a small scale. Okay, so to be exempt from having to have the EPA um, experimental use permit, if your water body is less than one acre and it's not used for irrigation and nobody's gonna be swimming in it and the fish aren't used for food, then they said, okay, you could go ahead and gather some data. But within Arizona, we have additional regulations. So we can't just go on the EPA exemption if we say, okay, we're gonna do something in a really small body of water. Because in Arizona, we have an Arizona Revised Statute 17-481, which is specific to application of aquatic poisons. And it requires a whole nother level of, of pretty strenuous um, accounting for what's going on and, and lots of testing and things like that um, specific to rodenone and anamycin. So any waters that are under the jurisdiction of the Arizona Game and Fish Department have to follow these same procedures. Now there's a little bit of, um, it, we're not super clear on if all these same procedures will apply to crayfish um, or to ponds, to fishless ponds, if we're talking about removing um, invertebrates for crayfish. So that's something that we'll need to talk with Game and Fish about and, and see if we can get some clarity on some of those things. And I think I saw Julie Carter on the call, so maybe if she wants to weigh in on that, we'll, we'll let her do that too. Um, so we have done one experimental treatment in the field. Um, let me go back. So this, this Arizona revised statute um, came about in, I think it was 2011, 2012, as a result of a rote known treatment that occurred down near the city of Patagonia. And, uh, and some of the ranchers got upset about that and they knew some, some lawmakers and it, and it ended up that this law went through. Um, well, about that same time, we were trying to, we were thinking about ways to kill crayfish, and, and we teamed up with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we went to a small tank uh, called Divide Tank off of Highway 260, where there's a crayfish population, and uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service was worried about these crayfish flooding down into the adjacent drainage and causing problems for the native uh, frogs that were there. So we went in and treated this little pond with liquid ammonia. We didn't use a, a pH increase or anything because at, at that time we didn't know anything about it. And uh, what happened was we were able to change the size structure of that crayfish population. We basically killed all the adults, but when we went back the next spring, there were all these young ones that had survived. It was pretty cold and some of And also there may be some differences in toxicity with different life stages that they will be chasing with this project. And that's one of the reasons we at first want to figure out, um, you know, what's the dosage of our new formulation that's going to be effective and also um, how does it affect different life stages? Okay, so we'll go back to these project objectives. Um, and maybe uh, Rebecca, do you want to finish this up here with the last couple of slides? Sure. Um, so the two stages of how we try to answer some of these questions. The first one is relatively easy. So David just talked about why we need to investigate um, these different life stages and um, species. We can do that in uh, the lab. We have a setup for that, no problem. Um, the second stage that luckily we have some time to plan for is the one where collaboration and ideas from folks at different agencies in different parts of the Southwest might be super helpful um, because we, we do want to find the best best small isolated field sites that um, we can to investigate some of these uh, questions about the necessary dose to control crayfish in the field where uh, there are natural plants and algae impacting the ammonia um, nitrogen cycle, there are different places for crayfish to hide. So getting into the field um, is going to be really important. And the options for doing that could be working in isolated stock ponds in Arizona, depending on how the rotenone and antimycin um, or aquatic poisons statute is applied in the cases of trying to use ammonia to control crayfish. Um, alternatively, we could do this kind of investigation on um, properties under different different jurisdiction 
So uh, fish and wildlife properties or military bases or private lands or potentially in other states that, um, you know, adjacent Utah, uh, uh, New Mexico, California that might have different uh, laws to contend with when trying to work out how we can investigate new chemical tools. So those are kind of the options. And the stage that we're at right now is um, starting to select, we have some really great applicants for a master's student to manage this project. People who have good background in experimental design, aquatic resource management, they've been working with fish or crayfish out in the field. And then some good experience with really communicating with and collaborating with agencies to try and find the best way to do some of this, which is gonna be really, really important. Um, so our deadline for applications to our grad program was just last week, um, and we're, we're just getting started on picking someone. Um, the first step, the lab work, will be easy, um, but we're trying to think ahead to what are the best places and ways to do this in the field. I see some enthusiasm from Utah, so <laughs> we can investigate uh, some options there. Thanks very much. I think that's all we have. So I'm gonna stop sharing and then uh, we can uh, turn it back over to you, uh, Matt. Sounds good. Thank you, David, Rebecca. Um, two very different uh, types of projects that we, we just heard about. Um, and I, I do wanna make sure that we have some time for Q&A here. So I'll go ahead and hand it over. And uh, Drew, I don't know if you wanted to jump on and you know talk about ideas for applications in Utah. Um, but if there are other questions, feel free to unmute yourselves and, and come on. I, I think, uh, I think David, you have corresponded with Chance Broderis, uh, one of our Northern region biologists about doing some ammonia stuff for green sunfish. And I don't, I don't think it went particularly lovely, but you know, we're still dialing it in, I think for that particular area, but we don't have in Utah the, you know, we use rotenone all the time. <laughs> I mean, and so, uh, other methods are welcome to try and they can, uh, we can easily build collaborations and uh, work in both places that you would be interested in. I can help you uh, connect with regional biologists anywhere you would probably be curious to work in, but also there'd be worth some follow-up chats just to see if we can kind of find a, a focal area for you in some other spots as well. Thank you, Drew. So um, yes, we did work with Chance Broderis. He had a pond there and, and he tried some experimental stuff and it was not effective. Um, and it was a real perplexing thing for us. Um, but that trial that he did also taught us a lot. I think we know now why it was not effective. It was actually a pH issue. Um, what we've discovered is that in some places, the pH is difficult to manipulate and be, it's difficult to maintain a high pH. And I think what happened in that instance was the pH went up, but it didn't stay up long enough to be toxic. Um, but yeah, I, I think the real key for the second phase of this project is going to be able to find small replicated places, um, particularly ideally where we only have crayfish, um, that we can go in and, and uh, get some data. Um, and if there are places that uh, where the, the federal EPA um, uh, guidelines are the only restrictions that we have to follow and there aren't additional state um, regulations on top of that, it will really facilitate things for us. Um, so thank you. Yeah, I, uh, feel free to email me after this. I'll try to put my email in the chat and I can try to put you in touch with some of our other regional biologists that are in our more crayfish rich part portions of the state. See if we can find something that'll work for you. You need, um, hey David, this is Robert Fisher. Um, uh, do you guys need how many ponds? We have one pond. We need treatment like next week if you guys could do it in California. It's on state fish and game lands or fish and wildlife lands. Um, and we've been trying to um, go through a rotenone permitting process for the last few years. And uh, it's not made. We've not gotten very far. But this seems like a much more suitable um, solution because California rotenone is a no-go for the most part. Um, but it's a it's crayfish. It's got um, gambusia and it's got um, a few catfish. But it's an isolated pond. It's less than an acre for sure. And I think Chris Brown's on the call, and he's calculated the um, 
the, the exact water amount in, in the pond. Um, so um, it, if that was possible, we don't have a replicated system, but we've got one that we could do as soon as possible. It would be awesome. We, we are super excited about these tools and we're super excited to collect data. So um, yeah, I, I would love to touch base with you and see what we can do to help because we, we really have a need to gather information and, and like, uh, like Drew was saying, so we tried it at this really small pond in Utah and it didn't work. <laughs> so you have to realize that this is research and, uh, and we're learning, but every chance that we get to try something um, is, a, is, is an opportunity where we can move this forward. So thanks for, uh, for your willingness to look into that. And, and definitely I'd wanna to touch base with you. The challenge is gonna be finding um, places where we can be opportunistic and do this, uh, where it has benefits for everyone, um, but also places that are comparable and let us answer some of those questions about temperature and, um, or comparable or vary uh, in a replicated um, way. So a little bit of planning about where, but um, any place that is possible, we should, we should put on a list and follow up for sure. And I think we probably can find a place um, where we can get good replication and get the good scientific data that, that we're going to need, um, especially with all of these great cooperators on board and, and this CCAS format. I mean, this is one of the things that's super exciting for me is that I've been wanting to work on this for a long time. And, and uh, because of Matt and, and the CCAS format, now there's, there's an opportunity to, to get some, some more heads involved and some more agencies involved and, and hopefully really make, make progress. So I'm super excited about this, Matt, and, and I appreciate you providing this opportunity for us. Of course, no problem. Um, and that's why I'm letting this go a couple minutes over. I don't wanna stop these conversations, of course, all this collaboration discussion I think is really essential. Um, have you guys looked at creek systems? We've got a small creek system we're also interested in that's full of crayfish. That is a great question. I would love to work on creek systems, but I'm, I'm gonna say we're not there yet. We've got to take this tool with some baby steps. Um, creek systems are, I think there's a potential to do great things in creek systems, but we've got to get data on small and closed systems first um, before we can even think about uh, doing something like that. Um, but yeah, that, that would be the ultimate goal. I just think we're a ways out on that. Okay, thanks. Great. Um, I did want to jump in because we did have one question in the chat, uh, David asking about, um, you know, crayfish and burrows and if you feel, well, I won't put words, words in Shell's mouth here, but there's a, you know, question about being able to address crayfish that are hiding in burrows in the field. Um, we don't know. I guess that's the short answer. Um, that's why we need to do a bunch of lab work. Um, we've got some setups in our lab where after we get the, the dosages and the durations dialed in, we're gonna be doing some things in some larger 150 gallon fiberglass tanks where we can add structure and mud and, and, and we'll be able to assess whether or not we can impact things in burrows or not. Um, uh, good question. We can also do some research in the field that doesn't involve killing anything just to figure out the the timing of when crayfish of different sizes are spending more time in burrows too if there's anywhere any way to be strategic there yeah lots of lots of unanswered questions but it's an exciting um exciting thing to be chasing because there's there's so much that we can learn that i think will really help us to develop these tools Uh, of the invasive crayfishes in the West, how many are actually obligate burrowers or actually spend that much time in burrows? Yeah, so we're specifically going to look at two species, the Orconectes virilis, I guess uh, it's Fasciolus now, Fasciolus virilis, the northern crayfish, and the red swamp crayfish. Um, there's one other uh, species that was in the original proposal that we kind of threw out because it's not found in Arizona yet and, and we didn't think we could get the permitting to work on it. So we're just going to focus on northern and red swamp crayfish. Um, yeah, and there are differences in the way those two species grow. All right, well now I am going to jump in because I want to make sure we don't lose everybody before a couple announcements. Um, but I want to thank, you know, everybody for presenting today and providing, you know, overview of the projects. Um, really excited to be able to put some funding toward those this year. And like it's been echoed a few times here, really excited to have the collaboration going with this group. 
Um, I think it's a demonstration of some really exciting things to come, I think, as we keep moving forward with CCAST and the community of practice. So uh, thanks again for the presentations and all of you for the engaging discussion. So really appreciate that.